WWE now more than ever are a truly global entity, something that's reflected in every aspect of the business, including where they choose to tour and produce shows. In recent years, we've seen major events take place in Australia and in the Middle East, and the company will be putting on a pay-per-view of some sort in the United Kingdom in September 2022. While their home base and biggest market is, of course, the United States of America, the truth is that WWE have been ever more reliant on international markets, which tend to remain strong as domestic business wanes. This started to become apparent in the early to mid 2000s or during the ruthless aggression era, if you prefer, with WWE more and more frequently heading overseas. This included a rare venture to the land of the rising sun, where the company taped both Raw and SmackDown in Japan for the first time ever. How did these shows come together? What happened on them? And halfway around the world, what did those crazy guys and gals get up to when the cameras weren't rolling? I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the true story of Raw and SmackDown in Japan. World Wrestling Entertainment had experienced mixed success when it came to their ventures to the Far East prior to taping Raw and SmackDown there in February of 2005. After co-promoting some shows with All Japan, New Japan, and Super World of Sports in the early 90s, WWE put on their own tour in May of 1994. Though it boasted appearances by The Undertaker and some juicy matches like Bret Hart vs Randy Savage for the WWE title, as well as a fully-fledged 30-man Royal Rumble, the four house shows didn't draw particularly well, maybe a reflection of WWE's flagging popularity in the country at the time. It must be said that Japan's wrestling scene was very much alive and well at this point, with the big promotions like All Japan and New Japan thriving, while smaller outfits like FMW, WAR, All Japan Women and others had dedicated followings and did strong business. WWE's 94 tour was deemed such a flop that they didn't return to the country for almost eight years. In the interim, WWE's popularity had gained in the country while Japan's own promotions began to struggle. So when WWE announced a special televised house show to take place on March 1st, 2002 at the Yokohama Arena, they managed to sell out the 16,000-seater within hours of tickets going on sale to the tune of $1.1 million. That show, headlined by The Rock taking on Chris Jericho in an undisputed title match, was a critical success as well, all but guaranteeing that WWE would tour in the country regularly going forwards. Which they certainly did, with both the Raw and SmackDown crews making the trip several times before WWE made the decision to tape each brand's respective TV show there in 2005. This was something that was announced just a few weeks before, the press release outlining the major stars appearing, while also noting that Japan's Fuji TV would be involved in the production. The tapings would take place during a longer tour that started with a combined Raw and SmackDown Super Show in Hawaii on February 1st, following which the two crews would fly out to Japan, tape Raw on the 4th, SmackDown on the 5th, while Raw did a house show in Seoul, South Korea, before flying back to the USA via Alaska when they would have another combined combined Super Show on the 6th. Now I feel jet lagged just reading that, and the WWE superstars working this whirlwind tour had to be at their best, especially when it came to the TV tapings. One performer who would not be making the tour despite being a major selling point in its advertisement was Vince McMahon himself. The genetic jackhammer was forced to stay in the States after undergoing surgery for the torn quad that he'd suffered during the calamitous finale to the 2005 Royal Rumble. Oh well, the show must go on and all the rest of it. Fans packed the Saitama Super Arena for WWE's flagship, and they were red hot from the get-go, reacting feverishly to absolutely everything, contrary to that reputation that they have in the West for being reserved and just politely clapping the action. You did have to feel sorry, though, for the poor guy who was on hand to translate Eric Bischoff's whole entire welcome and card rundown into Japanese. He was showered with booze, and a similar thing had happened on a previous WWE show in Japan because the fans wanted the authentic WWE experience and felt as though he detracted from that. Anyway, the fan enthusiasm was rewarded with a genuinely great show that struck the balance between catering to the locals while also furthering existing storylines for those watching from afar. Things kicked off with Chris's Benoit and Jericho squaring off in a submission match, an apt opener given both men's histories and reputations in Japan. It was a rough and rugged match, won by the Rabid Wolverine with the Crippler Crossface, and they shook hands afterwards before Y2J retreated backstage to nurse his sore head. And his noggin was pounding, not so much from the match, although that can't have really help things, but because he was self-admittedly suffering from a major hangover after getting boozy in Rapongi the night before. Chris, what are you like? 
Batista then continued his march towards WrestleMania by destroying Maven before local hero Tajiri partnered with William Regal to beat La Resistance and win the World Tag Team titles in a very well-received match. Wow, putting someone over in their own town or country and not humiliating them. What weird concept. Shawn Michaels pinned Ric Flair in a decent contest that, while no means an epic, was still Shawn Michaels versus Ric Flair and therefore very, very good regardless. Not as good was Randy Orton's win over Tyson Tomko, although that was more of an angle playing off the Legend Killer's storyline concussion and setting up an eventual match between Orton and Christian. Sumo legend Akibono showed up in the front row ahead of his WrestleMania showdown with Big Show, a real thing that actually did happen and don't you forget about it. And in the main event, Triple H retained the World Heavyweight title against Edge in a solid bout thanks to some outside help from the animal. The only real down spot on the entire show was an all-American diva fashion show, which was basically an excuse to get the women in bikinis before segueing into a bit between Simon Dean and host Jerry Lawler. The show, which aired three days later, was widely praised, as much for the different look and feel as for the quality of the action, which was certainly higher than usual. Could the blue brand hit the same standard a day later in the same arena? Um, in a word, no. It was an enjoyable edition of SmackDown, Smackers, Smacky D, the big smack, whatever you want to call it, helped immeasurably by a superb main event, but it wasn't quite on the same level as Raw. Said main event was the quarterfinals in the WWE title number one contenders tournament, a near 20 minute stunner between frequent foes Rey Mysterio and Kurt Angle. But their efforts just about saved what had been a fairly lackluster show, at least in comparison to what fans had been treated to the night before on Raw. The talents of Eddie Guerrero, another performer with a real history and reputation in Japan, were wasted against the homegrown Kenzo Suzuki, someone who was fast outliving his usefulness to WWE. In fact, this would be Kenzo's last SmackDown appearance as he was released in July after months of inactivity. Kenzo's wife Hiroko, who was released at the same time as her husband, had her homecoming spoiled after getting stripped down to her underwear by Tori Wilson in their so-called kimono match. Really good stuff. The Basham brothers versus Mark Jindrak and Luther Reigns and John Cena's victory over Orlando Jordan, also part of that number one contenders tournament, didn't exactly set the world on fire, although Funaki's cruiserweight title defense over Chava Guerrero was alright to be fair. But unfortunately, one of the better televised matches of the tour was, kind of typically, relegated to the little watched Velocity, with Paul London and Akio having their customary banger. Paul London, Akio, Velocity, the streets won't forget, etc. The thing most people remember from this particular episode of SmackDown is a drunk JBL getting into it with a giant inflatable Godzilla before being confronted by real-life Godzilla, The Big Show. Cultural sensitivity there, don't you just love it? The then WWE Champion had bigger issues on the tour, namely Amy Webber, the former Diva Search contestant who was signed and given the role of image consultant in Bradshaw's cabinet stable, quitting after claiming she was harassed by her co-workers on the flight to Japan, as well as when they arrived in the country itself. According to a video blog that she released on YouTube in 2020, she claims that she was ribbed when wrestlers found a card featuring a picture of her wearing lingerie at a gentleman's club in Japan. And though she didn't obviously work at the club herself, she did do some modeling and commercials in Japan about six months before starting the Diva Search, and the club had used her likeness in promotional materials unbeknownst to her. She also claims that on one of the flights during the tour, she was knocked out of her chair and viciously insulted by Randy Orton and had a drink purposefully poured on her by Edge, both done while she was asleep. Already feeling bad after suffering an injury while practicing a match with fellow Diva Search contestant Joy Giovanni, Amy decided she'd had enough and quit. She said in the video that she did so to Shane McMahon when they arrived back in Alaska, but Bruce Pritchard has claimed that she actually tried to quit first to her fictional boss, JBL, who subsequently informed her that doing so was pointless. Either way, she was gone, but she wasn't the only member of the WWE crew to allegedly suffer the wrath of the boys in the back. Muhammad Hassan, who supposedly was a bit of a heat seeker backstage, as well as being a heat magnet on TV, got the locker room worked up into a frenzy after apparently disrespecting WWE legend and road agent, Sergeant Slaughter. Sarge put Hassan over on Raw right before they flew out to Hawaii at the beginning of the tour, and according to the Hall of Famer, the rookie didn't show him due reverence, which earned him an earful from Steve Austin, but also resulted in physical physical receipts when Hassan participated in a 24-man battle royal in Honolulu. And then, and we can finally move on from all that unsavory business, it was back home to America for business as usual. While the Japanese TV tapings were a hit, WWE never did it again like they have done countless times in the UK, for example. They actually did return to the Saitama Super Arena just six months later for a pair of combined Raw and SmackDown Super Shows that featured loaded pay-per-view caliber cards, including a dream six-man tag pitting Rey Mysterio and the Brothers of Destruction 
against Kurt Angle, Edge, and Eddie Guerrero. But even with the stacked lineups, these non-televised shows did not draw as well, and WWE haven't been back to Saitama since, preferring instead to run in the markets of Tokyo, Yokohama, or Osaka. Their fortunes there, depending on how hot the WWE product is, have been a bit mixed. The closest WWE have come to doing TV from Japan again has been the 2015 Network Beast in the East special, which was basically a bit of a house show, with an NXT title change admittedly, and a rare Brock Lesnar sighting at the time. It would be a welcome change if WWE did do either TV tapings or even a proper pay-per-view from there in the future, because those shows over 15 years ago were like a breath of fresh air at the time, different in both presentation and style. They still stand out, all this time later.